first session of the cultural decarbonization workshop, and this session is on the topic of society wide action for decarbonization. And my name is Penny Matta. I'm a, a researcher here at the Queen's in a Horizon 2020 project called Mistral, and I'm also a PhD student. And the structure for this session is that I will first give, give a brief introduction to a concept which inspired the theme of this session, a whole society approach. And then we have three speakers. Um, and one of our speakers wasn't able to join us here today in person, so we'll have a video presentation for Rachel. And after me will be uh, Amanda, and then we can start the in-person presentations first. Uh, the session is set to end at L a half past 11, after which we have a short break and a second session. Um, so the theme of this session, society wide action, was inspired by a concept um, that I introduced in a paper last year called the Whole Society Approach. And this whole society approach is approach to governance. Um, and when I did this paper, I first, is that I first of all identified that there is something called the whole society approach. And then I found some um, engagement on the approach. There was a limited uh, amount of it. Uh, but I, what I didn't find was the definition for what a whole society approach is. Um, so what I went on to do in this paper is to give it a definition based on these limited um, resources that I was able to find on it. And then I adopted this uh, definition in analyzing the nation of climate policies in Ireland and Scotland and identified that it is present at this uh, policy discourse level. Um, so the whole society approach is an approach to governance of comprehensive challenges which requires society wide action. And the um, origins of the approach are in United Nations and World Health Organization guidance on mostly health related challenges but also other comprehensive challenges. Um, and pandemics is one key topic that this approach has been discussed in relation to. Um, and, and climate change clearly is similar challenges, requires type wide action, and therefore there is quite um, interesting potential for research and looking at um, the approaches to the COVID-19 pandemic, which were adaptations of the whole society approach, and comparing this to the approaches to decarbonization and seeing what could this mean. When, what could this whole society approach mean when adopted to the uh, decarbonization? Because, um, as I said in this paper, I identified this in the um, discourse level, policy discourse level, but there clearly isn't as um, drastic approach taken to decarbonization. Um, as I said, I gave a definition for the approach, um, and I did this by giving it five characteristics. Uh, and these five characteristics are mutually enforcing uh, and context dependent, and they work at different levels. Um, since introducing this approach, I have adopted it to uh, analysis of public involvement in the energy transition. Some of the examples that I've been talking about are related to that context. And first of the characteristics is crisis. So, as said, this is an um, approach that is adopted to comprehensive challenges. Um, and the key part of this is that these are challenges which impact the whole society and therefore require the whole society's participation. And one concept that I like using uh, when explaining this is uh, switch makers persistent problems. This means problems which are created and recreated by the system that they operate in. And this clearly resonates with the um, climate change crisis and the carbon loft in society that we live in. A key part of this is shared responsibility, meaning that essentially everyone is a stakeholder in these kind of challenges and answering these challenges. Um, so in relation to the energy transition, I have looked at uh, prosumers, energy citizens, and these more active roles given to the public. And inclusivity is a key element of answering this challenge. So because the goal is society-wide action, any exclusion becomes a question of effectiveness. So leaving nations or sectors of society or individuals behind means lack of action. It means setting parts of the system um, into a state that is not changing, essentially. Um, and this is talked about with the lot in the next transition, with the trust, trust transition concept, which is also um, talked to in, in relation to climate change in general. Um, but I like to use the individual level as an example of this. Uh, because decarbonization of housing is one of the key challenges in Ireland and uh, UK. At the same time, it requires significant cost. So if, from a governance perspective, only those who are able to pay and willing to pay are going to decarbonize their housing, we are going to fail decarbonizing housing. There's going to be a group of people who are um, high carbon emitters, who are in um, 
increased risk of energy poverty. But therefore, there is a need for facilitation of these um, vulnerabilities and unequal resources. Uh, this relates to the leadership characteristic, then, which has two elements. First of all, is the whole of government approach, to take a similar type of collaboration inside of government, working across uh, government um, areas and uh, policy domains, and uh, integration of policy issues into all policy areas. And another element of it is facilitation. This means taking a governance approach, with, which instead of singular solutions, it takes a whole holistic approach of multiple um, measures to try to aim the system and to change the system and to create an environment that supports the, um, supports the wanted actions. Um, a key example of this is um, electric vehicles and active transport. You can just tell people not to stop driving, car, driving cars or just, stop, um, or just adopt electric vehicles because there are many barriers to this. So here again there's a need to look at you know, charging infrastructure, there's need to look at the culture around cars and many different behaviors around travel. And this facilitation element as well as other elements highlight systems thinking. Uh, there's a need to understand that these challenges are systemic and also the solution need to be systems oriented. And the key element of this is understanding that this system is not just economic or uh, technological transformation is a transformation of the whole system, essentially the whole society, which requires also changing the social aspects, culture, ways of thinking, um, and essentially the whole society. And as John Barry um, highlighted at the beginning, this is not a change towards worse society, but change towards different society. Uh, but this was just a brief introduction to the whole society concept because it inspired the theme of this session. I'm eager to get to our first presentation. Um, so Dr. Amanda Slade, uh, welcome. Welcome, Ms. Ingolfi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Brilliant to see you all here today. Um, I'm delighted to join this session on society-wide decarbonisation. Um, some of you know that I co-direct the Centre for Sustainability, Equality and Climate Action with Professor Barry, and I'm an environmental sociologist with a background in community development. So some of those themes come through in my talk today, which is about communities, specifically as catalysts for society-wide decarbonisation. And why, why am I focused on communities? Well, I've been focused on communities for over 20 years, but also I think it's a really important locus for to, us to understand where we can direct attention, where we can bring people together as a basis for transformative action. And I strictly use the word communities in this space to really make clear differences with broader culture. Culture is sometimes used in a homogenous way that we all share one culture, which we don't. There are multiple cultures, and we can see that here in Northern Ireland, where a culture for some is wearing orange sashes and participating in marches, where for others that's not what their culture is. So culture is, is, is very diverse, it's very um, contingent in different spaces and backgrounds, and, and communities is one way of understanding the diversity of cultures and, and uh, perspectives uh, as a basis for climate action. And so I begin with, I suppose, reiterating some of the things that John has talked about in Hiroki and, and Semi, and um, my slides aren't moving on here. Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> and Teresa is also a core part of the Centre for Sustainability, who also we won't survive better. Um, so, supposed to think about communities and think about where we want to go, we need to think about where we want to move away from. You know, John and Hiroki have talked about the science behind uh, understands of climate breakdown and the connections between the socio-ecological crises 
um, in terms of both our wider environmental damage and the impacts on uh, ecosystems. And so to, to start thinking about where we want to go, let's think about where we want to move away from. Uh, and for me that involves joining the dots and the type of things that we see in Emory's work and others where we're looking at how our dependency on fossil fuels, what that means at a local level uh, and what that means on a global scale as well. Um, so when I think about communities for socio-ecological transformation, that has to involve a joining of the dots, the global local connections, so that we're connecting what we put into our cars and our individual uh, patterns of transport and consumption with the broader process and consequence like we see in the Niger Delta, or like we see through the shale gas uh, conflicts across Ireland and UK, or the carb gas conflict in Mayo. So to think about what don't we want? Well, for me, for a single future, this is what I don't want. I, you know, to, to problematise and make clear these systems of consumption and production, which are based on socio-ecological devastation and which are completely unsustainable. And to use that analysis as a counterpoint for what we can imagine as a better future. Uh, and so a key point, I believe, is that how can we develop socio-ecological imagination? Now that seems like a grand concept, and it is indeed. You know, we can trace back the idea of a socio, um, sociological imagination to the work of C. Wright Mills, um, a sociologist who talked about sociological imagination as a way of problematizing or making clear our individual choices and behaviors as a way to connect them to the grand scale, to, to the bigger global problems. And to his analysis, I add the concept of ecological imagination. So we have socio-ecological imagination. So like we're connecting our individual choices, example, fossil fuels and the connection with the local and global of, uh, in the context of Nigeria. In this case, we're connecting our everyday behaviours with the broader environmental and social impacts of that. And that involves, on one hand, rethinking how we relate to nature that nature is not simply a commodity for us to use and to make money from. That to also to rethink about our dependency on nature for water, for air, for food, for shelter, we literally cannot survive without nature. So in a socio-ecological imagination, it's rethinking and understanding our complete interdependencies with our natural world. And also reimagining what a better world looks like in harmony with nature, in harmony with each other. So socio-ecological imagination as a different way of thinking, as a starting point for change. And for me, that change also involves learning. Um, I really like the, uh, the Socrates uh, paradox that Mesro talks about. When, how do we know what we need to learn if we don't know what the problem is? That sounds a bit complex. I'll let you read the paradox there uh, yourselves. But also, this is about, you know, if we live in a society where we don't problematize systems of consumption and production, which are degrading our environment, which are creating an existential crisis for society, if we don't understand that's a problem, how do we know what to do about it? How do we know what the solutions are? And so, climate action has to be about learning spaces for everybody. You know, we talk about, and particularly in the university, John and I and others are really clear about trying to create new teaching and learning around sustainability and climate action. That's brilliant. You know, we're helping to equip students with skills and knowledges to, to uh, move towards a better future. But what about those of us who aren't in universities, who aren't uh, accessing formal education, who are living in their lives and are uh, really busy with everyday lives and with challenges and bills and stresses? How do we create a space for people to understand the challenge that we face? and to explore what the solutions are. And that's where we have to make learning about the issues that we face and about potential solutions accessible to every single adult, child, young person. Learning about climate action has to occur across the life course. And again, this is where communities are really crucial. That we can make learning about these issues accessible to everybody at a local level, in a space that is accessible in a way universities aren't. So the uh, building towards my communities are really important as you can tell. So it entails socio-ecological imagination, it involves learning, and it also involves connecting reflection through the imagination and learning with action. Uh, and I am a big fan of Paulo Freire, I'm sure many of you are aware of Paulo Freire, uh, a Brazilian educator whose work was really about social transformation. How do we transform our world? Now Freire's work was mostly about social, socio-economic inequalities and transformation. Um, but he did have some attention to ecological issues throughout his books, um, particularly in, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, where he recognised that we are interdependent on our world. 
and, and that we can't live without each other and what their natural world. But Ferry's work is particularly relevant in the case of climate breakdown and action because he talks about how to change the world we need both critical consciousness, reflection upon the issues that we face, combined with action at all levels of society to bring about change. So we need sustainability practices, reflection and action upon the world in order to transform it. Fiora talks about that sustainability practices involving knowledge co-production to co-create visions, ideas and knowledge as a basis for specific contextualized solutions. And that has to happen in and with communities. So community, uh, I've mentioned culture being uh, a diverse term that's sometimes used in an exclusionary way. Community is also, can also be used in an exclusionary way. We see that in Northern Ireland very clearly, where community has come to be understood as one, one type of community, so nationalist versus unionist. So we've really, if you take that analysis that we see in, in some legislation, we have three communities in Northern Ireland, unionists, nationalists and others. And that's a very simplistic, exclusionary way of understanding humanity, our interrelationships and our diversities. Uh, I like Ledwith's definition of community, because I recognise that we have different interrelationships, we connect across social difference, diverse histories and cultures, and is determined in the present by political and social trends. So what I'm trying to do is tease out the idea of community as being diverse, as being both, uh, as Ledwood points out, or as Wilmot's defi definition points out, it can be based in communities, so we can understand community as a geographical construct. So we have our communities and our neighbourhoods, or we can revolve around our community centres and community halls. But we can also have communities of interest or interest groups, where people are coming together with a shared view. Uh, so that might be, you know, think about how eco-villages are set up. People have a dream and a vision for something better, for something different. And those ideas form the basis of people coming together to put those ideas into action. And then in Wilmot's death, third category of community, we can see a group composed of people sharing a common condition or a problem. And in that we see many examples of community, the diversity of communities, people coming together with common issues. And it's a bit of a stretch, but I would see the the third category is applicable to us as a human species, that we share a common problem that we are facing, uh, the biggest crisis that we've ever faced. And unless we collectively come together, we're not going to be able to take action, respond to the challenge we face within this, the, the time frame that's needed. So these analysis, I want us to, to recognise that community is diverse, community uh, can involve the visceral connection to place, the visceral connection to each other, our relationships, but also as a way of understanding us as a human species and how we can take action at different levels. So it can be the local level of community energy production, it could be the local level of community gardens and uh, restructuring food production to localise food production. It can also be uh, across national and global scales. And I'd like to point uh, and illustrate the impact of a, a group of communities, a community of communities, where we have been leading on a decarbonisation agenda. Um, some of you will be familiar with uh, Climate Coalition Northern Ireland, and delighted to see some of my colleagues here today, um, where we are a, a community of broader communities concerned with climate action. And we came together in early 2020 uh, involving communities based in local areas, uh, communities of our own common interests, so environmental NGOs, we had students groups, farming organisations, businesses, mm -hmm. academics, other civil society groups as well. And we came together to facilitate collaboration around climate, to think about how can we advance climate action at multi-levels across Northern Ireland. Um, and so our organisation began to look at what the directions we could take, uh, fo focusing on both mitigation, so reducing our emissions, and also adaptation. Uh, and as our coalition grew, our, our member organisations grew to represent over 400,000 people across Northern Ireland. So we became the biggest coalition for climate action in the north, but to frame it as a community of communities that we are explicitly a group of groups working together um, to facilitate action. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the political context of Northern Ireland, uh, you'll know that the that there has been significant issues around advancing climate action, not least because of the absence of climate legislation. Um, the UK has its own climate bill introduced in 2008. And despite advice from the Committee on Climate Change, despite um, multiple efforts between 2008 
uh, until recent years, there had been no climate um, legislation. And as a result, there was an absence of, of clear policy and clear action and resources dedicated towards society-wide decarbonisation in Northern Ireland. Um, in 2020, uh, when the Assembly uh, reconvened after uh, an absence of three years, there were, we began to see attention to climate action through the New Decade New Approach, the, the document underpinning the Assembly's uh, uh, reconvening, we're talked about and committed to climate action uh, and climate legislation. That was in January 2020. The Assembly declared a climate and ecological emergency in February. By July, it became really clear that the relevant minister uh, was not taking action on climate and indeed was not going to give any timelines for that. We saw in July 2020, in the Assembly, the Assembly passed a motion by the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs calling for urgent climate legislation to be introduced in three months. The Minister dismissed that, uh, dismissed the majority support in the Assembly for urgent climate legislation, saying that it would not be possible, it indeed he said it would be impossible, and he ridiculed the possibility of urgent climate legislation. So recognising that the absence of climate legislation was hampering the ability for us to have multi-level climate action in Northern Ireland, our coalition began to work with cross-party, cross-community MLAs, and independent legal experts to look at how can we advance climate legislation, set that basis as a mechanism to drive climate action in Northern Ireland. And so we did something that hasn't been done before. We brought together the majority of the MLAs from across the community. So we had unionists, we had nationalists, we had uh, MLAs who identify as others with independent legal experts, and we drafted and introduced Northern Ireland's first climate bill within three months. Uh, and that subsidy mobilisation, that partnership approach with MLAs and with independent legal experts, radically ramped up attention to climate action and set the agenda for, for action. And we went from a point of having no climate legislation, no climate bills, to having two bills within the space of a year. And that was driven by people, that was driven by civil society. Now, I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, I find it too easy to go into detail this sort of stuff. I'll spare you that all. If you have questions, we can talk a bit about it today uh, when it comes to questions. But we went from a point of no legislation, with no ambition, uh, with the absence of, of legislation and policy, which hampered multi-level climate action, to a point where civil society's mechanisms and community uh, ambition led to clear net zero targets, led to demands for independent oversight, for spectral plans, um, and, and for ambition. And so we can see that civil society and this community of communities has really set the agenda for decarbonisation pathways in, in Northern Ireland. So as a result of our work and a lot of political discussion and debate and um, collaboration of last years, we have had Northern Ireland's first climate bill passed by the Assembly and is now waiting, awaiting royal assent. And it's arguable that would not have happened without civil society intervention. It would not have happened if people from communities take a, a grassroots approach and led in the absence of political leadership. And so to try and, and wrap up, uh, you know, I've briefly referred to different types of communities. Um, and ultimately, what we need to do is create spaces at different levels of our societies to bring people together, to have critical conversations about the issues that we face, to create spaces for learning about what the issues are and how we resolve the problems that we face, to create spaces for skills development and knowledge development, so that we're equipping ourselves and our wider communities with the cap capabilities to transition to a better future. And as Van, Van Dana Shiva points out, in, in 2008, to have a, a better future, to work towards a better future, Johnson, to be hopeful for a better future, we need to reassess our socio-ecological world. On one hand, that involves the, the impact and understanding the impact of globalisation, like I talked about, developing that socio-ecological consciousness and imagination so that we can see these global, local connections and how they relate to our everyday lives. But also to imagine what a better world looks like and what it will take to get to a better world. Um, and communities are a central space for that, where people come together to articulate what's needed to move towards a better future, to move and to realise an alternative order that puts ecological and social and economic justice at the heart of policy. So thank you for listening. Look forward to your questions. I'm a research fellow in the School of National and Built Environment and I'm currently working in the Queen's Community in Case, which is a new initiative 
in Queens, which focuses on enhancing the community engagement of Queens, um, which is just based across the Fitzwilliam Street. Um, so it's kind of told by the leader of that, Professor Kathy Higgins, to kind of promote that a bit more because it is a new initiative. Um, but I think a lot of their work will lead into what I'm talking about today, despite the fact this uh, presentation stems from my PhD, which I finished last year um, in the planning department, um, which really focused on, like Sandy said, sorry, uh, citizen science, which is a participatory approach to research. Um, and although I focused on marine and coastal planning issues, um, I'm going to try and bring out and brought on that out to more wider discussion of what citizen action um, in regards to participatory research can mean um, for this kind of wider discussion with Amanda and John and everyone else talked about getting more people involved with uh, climate action. So just in terms of the kind of overview of this presentation, this is uh, stemming from a book chapter that I've written and actually just resubmitted corrections yesterday, so hopefully it's, it's fresh in my mind. Um, but I'll begin with just quite a brief over um, view of a little bit of what um, Amanda just talked about in her great presentation of kind of this general movement of increasing the involvement of community um, in movements towards sustainability and um, decarbonisation more broadly. And I'll focus the presentation to look into citizen science, which I said is the kind of lens of focus that I have in my PhD. Um, so I'll introduce what citizen science is and provide some um, examples of it in practice um, and then talk about the uh, kind of professionalization of this practice of citizen science, which I discovered um, what was revealed through the findings of my research. And I'll talk about the opportunities and challenges of that kind of movement towards more professionalized approach to participatory research means um, and, and in general kind of focus upon the limitations of a more professionalized approach and try and use those as learning lessons, um, which can be used for more broader community action and, and realize how we can get around these challenges which have come up um, in citizen science. So yeah, I prefer we won't talk too much on just community action in general, because I think Amanda's presentation really covered that well. And, um, just in general, I think we've all seen a massive increase in the last number of years of a general kind of consensus and, and desire to get more involved and be motivated to be involved with action against climate change and environmental degradation. Um, certainly from a community perspective, well, of all walks of life, of all people, of all, of all ages as well, um, getting involved. And I guess one of the key things I always noticed was the kind of youth interest and motivation to get involved in climate action uh, from the climate strikes. And I really always have an interest in that. Um, I was always interested in learning a bit more about the mobilization of this action. So as well as protesting and, and taking part in, in demonstrations, how can we really mobilize that uh, desire and that potential power to, to call for change? Um, so I looked into this kind of scientific lens of, well, okay, can communities get involved with scientific projects and can that lend a, kind of more of a knowledge basis and more of a scientific lens to their action? And what might that mean for more of a community involvement in the actual decision-making process of how the environment is, is managed and governed. <clears throat> so like I said, my research over the last number of years has focused on citizen science. So in general, citizen science is just another term for a number or a range of uh, approaches to participate in research where members of the public get involved in science, but not necessarily through an academic or industrial um, environment. Um, and I'll talk about some examples of these projects, but in, in general it's really community, uh, people getting involved in scientific projects, be they run through non-governmental organisations, um, or funded through government as well, and that kind of lens of governance for this something I'll focus on, or just community projects themselves set up by community individuals, um, and, how, and how they're engaging with scientific projects to collect information on specific environmental issues, um, how they then try and mobilise that information to call for change or to com contribute towards um, existing decision-making processes. Um, so kind of in terms of the objectives of citizen science, again, these will be similar objectives to other types of participatory research, um, but they're really looking to see how you can exa expand the, the capacity of researchers themselves. So in this case, of course, citizens can be the researchers and the co-producers of the knowledge. So how can the SC extend their capacity to engage with uh, scientific actions and, and their kind of wider learnings on environmental and scientific issues? And secondly, kind of, kind of the key point, I guess, of citizen science is really democratizing all this production. So I can get more people involved, um, and not just stick with more traditional approaches to science and why science is done, um, but how can we have more of a whole of society approach, um, as Sonny was talking about, to how knowledge is produced and how that knowledge is shared and disseminated, um, and then has impact upon things. Um, and finally, it's really is um, awareness of these important social and environmental issues, which are often kind of forgotten by and aren't necessarily looked at from a more traditional scientific approach, um, or more kind of governmental focus on scientific issues and environmental issues. Um, so I can get community members involved to have direct impact of environmental change and, and the kind of damage that certain climate change aspects are having. How can they uh, factor those through these citizen science projects and then ensure that they are heard and covered and awareness is raised about them? 
And in terms of the outputs of citizen science, um, of course, it's a cost-effective approach to scientific um, and knowledge production in the sense that it doesn't use traditional scientific approaches and professionalized approaches. It does use these volunteers who are getting involved and motivated because of their own will um, and doesn't necessarily have a financial aspect to it. Some projects do have financial aspects and um, find much more uh, voluntary approach to getting involved. So in that sense, it's certainly a cost-effective approach. And I think that's kind of a key aspect as to why citizen science has grown in recent years and certainly the interest of government has grown in it um, as they realize this is something they can focus on which doesn't necessarily have the financial resource uh, restrictions <coughs> and necessities um, the more traditional approaches do. <coughs> and kind of the other two kind of key outputs, um, a bit like I mentioned the objective, it's kind of broadening the engagement of communities in governance processes. Um, and certainly individuals and citizens who in the past maybe have been marginalized and haven't been able to have a say in certain issues that affect their local community, this gives them a platform to get involved with that. Um, and finally, it kind of does not mention already, the idea of how you can enhance the capacity of the researchers to the people who take part in these projects, how can you, by taking part, how can their knowledge of scientific and environmental issues be enhanced, and how can their ability to take part in scientific endeavours also be enhanced. We're thinking about a wider scale as well, and certainly some of the, the findings I find when I talk to volunteers, um, their self-confidence can be boosted, their engagement with communities and their ability to think they, have, they do have a say over um, important issues, certainly that's much increased as well, so kind of a wide range of outputs that can be realised. <coughs> And in general, in literature, that's led to this idea that citizen science can then therefore be a transformative process. So it not just in a, a contributory manner, kind of create knowledge and co-produce knowledge um, that feeds into existing kind of data sets and existing kind of conversations, but it can also be more transformative, so it can lead to change and it can instigate change. Um, and in general, this idea of how to turn science into something that's more transparent, something that's more relevant to society in general, um, and of course, how it can lead to more democratic and more um, or greater involvement of all of people in um, important discussions. So just to give some examples of citizen science, um, as I said, I focus on marine uh, planning as my background, so I looked into particular marine and coastal citizen science projects, um, but of course these projects exist in terrestrial realms as well. Um, some of the projects in Northern Ireland that I looked into included um, Sea Search, which is a diving company um, of volunteers. Um, they get involved with underwater uh, monitoring of ecosystems and habitats. Some of the other projects that I looked into were beach cleanings, which I think um, Rachel might talk about in um, her presentation next. Um, and these aren't necessarily just cleaning beaches, but also recording of the, the, the litter that is there, um, and factoring this into data sets and using that information to understand more about how litter is affecting our coastlines um, and how that can be challenged. And some other projects as well, more on the monitoring side of things, so bird watches um, and whale watching as well. And there's a whole number of different projects, um, and they largely fall under kind of three different categories, or in, in literature at least they discuss under three different categories of being contributory, um, so that's the level where volunteers only get involved in the data collection stage, um, so they're collecting information from monitoring programs and putting that forward, but not necessarily engaging with the wider analysis of that data um, or the setup of the design of the projects. But then you have to, these two higher projects which have kind of a higher level of engagement, collaborative projects and co um, and it's at that level, the co level in particular, where the volunteers will be able to design these projects and, and shape them how they, they wish. Um, and literature is only really collaborative and co-produced co -produced projects that we talked about as having a transformative potential, but um, in the books after that, this stems from, I'm quite keen to argument that I think all projects do have a transformative potential and transformation needs to be understood maybe in a more detailed manner, um, how it can affect all volunteers, even if it's just contributory information that they're putting forward. Um, and also just in terms of the organisational dynamics of programmes, as I mentioned, the sort of a lot of them are run by uh, non-governmental organisations. So some of these examples are from the RSPB or Ulster Wildlife um, and the Irish Rural and Dolphin Group. Um, but a lot of these projects also have involvement from government as well from the funding um, uh, stance. So they're funded by government departments and that gives them a link to policy realms. Um, and that's what I really find interesting. So I'll talk about a little more detail the kind of opportunities and, and challenges that kind of professionalisation and the, the link to government provides. Um, how we can maybe learn some things from that for wider community initiatives. And just one example I focus on in particular, because um, I thought it was a great example of, of transformative citizen science and how volunteers really can have a say and it kind of gets you excited and sometimes to see it can be a real good outfit in terms of instigating change. So the, as I mentioned, Sea Search is a, a dive, volunteer diving program um, in Northern Ireland, across the UK and Ireland as well. Um, and one of the projects they did in recent years was um, in Waterford, which is off the east coast of Antrim. And a lot of the volunteer divers discovered a, um, a bed of seagrass, which is one of the largest in around the Irish seas, I think. Um, and they thought this was important, and it wasn't currently designated as an area of food protection, so there was no 
limitations in terms of what actions could happen there from fishing to, to leisure activities, so there's no protection. Um, so the volunteers themselves recorded a lot of information, <coughs> put this forward to the to DERA um, and suggested that this could be or should be protected areas and sure that the seagrass um, is well conserved. Um, so then DERA took their own scientific programs and monitored it and valued it and they decided it would be a marine conservation zone. Um, and obviously there's still a massive element of the government having to put this forward and having the hard SE designated, but it shows a bit like the, the climate action that Matt talked about, that it can be insulated and can be kicked off by volunteers and members of the public. So I kind of looked into that project and thought, okay, this is interesting, this is a, a clear example of how this can happen, so how can other projects maybe become more transformative and how can other bars of uh, current projects do face, how can they be overcome? The key thing that I find, um, certainly in the literature, is that there was a lack of real definition of what transformation is. Um, in particular, it wasn't really a conceptual understanding of how transformation can occur. Um, so I looked into the work of Foucault, which I know John has already mentioned, and I'm sure many of you have looked into. Um, how he talked about power must be understood in kind of all social operations, and particularly in regards to transformation. So current literature wasn't really um, expansive enough in understanding how citizen science can escape transformation, but the fact that it didn't really get into power dimensions and how power can be challenged in the first place. So like I said, Foucault really looks at this idea of we must understand power in all situations. Um, and a kind of key difference between the Foucaultian approach to understanding power and other philosophers is that Foucault looked into excuse me, more of a productive approach to power. So traditionally power is understood as being power over, so uh, an ability of power to, to uh, direct the actions and behaviours of individuals, um, but not necessarily having this productive capacity as well, which Foucault then looked into to say, okay, power can also not just be regressive, but it can instigate chains and lead to chains and the lead to the creation of these things, be they discourses or policies or different sides of action as well. Um, so in this sense, uh, power is not a zero-sum game. Um, it can be challenged and there is a balance that can be challenged as well. So just by taking power from someone and giving it to someone else doesn't necessarily mean that that person can also be in power in, in future uh, conditions or uh, times. Um, and the key kind of focus of, of the Foucaultian understanding of power that I take to say to the science research is that this balance between power and knowledge. So Foucault has a kind of a conceptual understanding called power and knowledge where he, he lands upon the, I think it's Francis Bacon who talked about power as knowledge, or knowledge is power. Um, and Foucault kind of accepts that, but also <coughs> returns to saying, well, if you understand power as being a means of knowledge, you must also understand knowledge as being a means of power. So there can be a body of power that isn't in some way supported by a body of knowledge. And like a body of knowledge cannot have influence if it isn't supported by certain power relations as well. So it's this kind of balance between power and knowledge and how they're co constitutive of each other. <clears throat> and how knowledge is more than just an instrument, um, how it really has significance and can change things that I thought was really relevant to citizen science and, and that's why I thought it was a useful lens to look into. So um, I'll just talk briefly about the findings, we won't talk about methodology in too much detail for you, but um, it's a range of different interviews with practitioners and government um, bodies who are involved with citizen science and then uh, talk with volunteers as well to understand their perspective. So try to get as much of a comprehensive cover of, of all the kind of competing actors in citizen science to understand it. And what I really find is that there's a process, particularly in those projects that are funded by government, I should say as well, these kind of focus of the projects I looked into in detail. There's kind of a process of, of uh, professionalization. So these projects are becoming less amateur based, and more um, professionalized, and, and as I was talking about, influenced by more of a government approach to understanding what science is and how it should be conducted. Um, but in a general sense, and something that people in the, the wider realm of co production have talked about, <coughs> it's important to realize these imbalances of power. Um, so unequal part in the dynamics between the volunteers, the practitioners, um, those are the kind of coordinators of the projects, and the government bodies who have invested in these citizen science projects. Um, and I think that's something in a conceptual sense that was really missing from the literature. So that was kind of a basis to go from to understand okay, the, there are imbalances between these actors, um, how is this influencing how projects are organized and, and how they evolve as well. Um, and I think this <clears throat> the key kind of thing, like I said, a lot of these projects are now funded by government. The key thing is that shifting positionality of government. So, at one stage, they were just the, the research users of, of this data. So, they reduced <coughs> the information that was put forward by citizen science and they maybe factored into the policy they didn't factor it in. But they've moved from that uh, position of just being an end user to a co producer of the programs as well, of the projects as well. So, they have a much greater significance uh, or significant influence on how these projects are developed. Um, and particularly, I kind of find four key um, examples of that. First of all, in terms of how objectives are set. So. Objectives aren't just set by the practitioners and, and have input from the volunteers, but also the, the government bodies who are investing in some of these programs also have a say over the objectives. So, as I talk about, sometimes the projects find that they, they can't really challenge what um, the government is suggesting they should look into. Quite often, it's kind of predefined questions that are set up by the government um, bodies. 
that they want citizen science to look and see. So in that sense, it kind of limits the potential transformative potential of projects and really push towards um, creating certain types of knowledge, um, which is also another part of knowledge types. So what I find is obviously um, a lot of these projects produce quantity of knowledge from surveys, monitoring programs. Uh, and that's really the only kind of information in, in these exams that I looked into that the government bodies are interested in. So it's a real shame some of the practitioners and volunteers to talk about a lot of the quality of information they have, the really story, um, storytelling opportunities or narratives that they have about their local areas that are significant and they're useful information, but they're not allowed to be factored into these programs. Uh, so they do the kind of standards of, of data collection that are set up by the projects, um, but also just standards of, of participation as well, not just standards of, of knowledge. So allowing volunteers to only operate in certain ways and carry out certain tasks rather than more of an open approach to citizen science, but maybe in its, um, its background and its basis was for its staff from a more open approach to participation. Um, and the final kind of a factor of how government is having more of its way is in regards to the duration of projects. So as, in, as well, many of us in research will understand, obviously a lot of funding is only for short-term short -term periods of time. Um, and certainly that's the case with citizen science as well. So funding, understandably, will be, be, be provided for a couple of years' time. Um, but a lot of the practitioners and volunteers find this difficult to then set up a project that can really have an impact over time because it takes a while to get volunteers to the level of where they can produce scientific knowledge, to the level that can, that can influence policy decisions, um, and also takes time to build up a good bed of volunteers as well. So they find it as a kind of a limitation that they, there are shorter terms that they must work to. Um, it's kind of, kind of harm the volunteers that they do have and also the, the scope of the projects that they would like to set up. Um, and just as I mentioned, like I say, some of the <coughs> practitioners will feel this relationship with uh, government funding can really be a hindrance upon what they want to achieve um, and how they can feel uncomfortable times to challenge the, the decisions which are put forward in terms of the objectives or how knowledge is produced um, by government bodies. And I think that's already a bit of an example of the kind of imbalances of, of power that do exist. <coughs> and just some, some quotes from the, the interviews that I've carried out, I think we're quite encapsulated of this um, from the government management kind of side. Like I mentioned, quite often projects are pushed towards answering these, these policy gaps or these predefined questions. Um, and that's the interpretation the government have in some cases of citizen science that they can fill certain gaps, which some projects are happy to do, but at the same time it might limit the tra transformative potential of other projects but, which would seek to go beyond that. Um, and also from the practitioner side, uh, quite a useful comment was this idea of boundary bridging and boundary policing. So they mentioned how government funding can help bind or can help bridge the boundary between uh, citizen action and policy decisions that provides this platform to, to share knowledge um, to the, the individuals and the bodies who can actually inform policy and can make change. But at the same time, it creates this kind of policing function that, um, as I mentioned, sometimes objectives can be organized in certain ways or the knowledge that they can produce can be organized in certain ways. So uh, the, the kind of funding relationship also has this policing effect um, where they can be limited in some things that they do. And the second kind of theme, and final theme from the findings I'll talk about, is more on the participation side of things. So, the kind of last side was about the organisation of dynamics, of how projects are organised and how they evolve. And this is more about how volunteers actually get involved in the projects themselves. Um, and what I find really is kind of what I mentioned, I suppose, already, is that participation can often, in the process I looked into, overly be focused on filling gaps and answering certain questions which have already been designed and set up. And already that kind of limits the, the potential participation of volunteers. Um, it doesn't give them much leeway or agency to really shape things. Um, they carried out surveys to volunteers and find that roughly about half the volunteers felt that their motivations for taking part in, in the projects. Either they wanted to become more environmentally active or they wanted to give their local knowledge a, a chance to have an impact at, at the policy level. Only half of those people find that those motivations are actually realised in the first place. Um, and in general, this kind of idea of, of professionalisation, going back to a little bit of what Kapoor talks about, and, this concept of governmentality is that often volunteers, from analysing the responses in a way, it seems that they have, they're forced to self-police and their kind of activism, <coughs> and they're forced to maybe operate in, in more um, environmentalist or careerist kind of approaches. And that kind of stems from a factor analysis that I did of the volunteers in answer surveys. So different types of volunteers exist and different motivations for taking part, and they desire different outcomes. Um, a lot of them are very activist-based, and they, they really want to challenge things and use the goals that they do have. Um, but they felt that at times projects were pushing them away from being able to operate like that or not offering them tasks within the project to be able to really operate in a, an activist manner. Um, in some ways, in some of the projects that pushed the volunteers away from taking part, so some of the practitioners talked about how that was such a hindrance that they were losing really useful volunteers and they were losing potential output um, simply because the projects weren't able to, to accommodate for these volunteers. And I know that Amanda touched on a really important theme of how it needs to be a society wide and needs to be a broader range of people. They're providing accessibility to take part in these projects or in any type of climate action, 
um, assistant science is often uh, kind of wrestle with that aspect because it's still quite close upon well educated people um, from well to do backgrounds and predominantly white individuals as well. So, citizen science is quite, quite keen to broaden the pathways to participation, but at the same time, um, some of my findings reveal that they still have limitations that can uh, prove, prove that to be a challenge. Um, and the final kind of point I was going to mention is, like I say, when projects are failing to accommodate for their the volunteers when they're not providing good um, feedback to them, understanding their concerns and requirements, they can then lose its potential contribution. And the volunteers who, who still need to, they may be at some times finding it hard to maximise the potential contribution that they do have as well. <coughs> and again, just to emphasise that some quotes from volunteers have mentioned how they are very empowered to take part in these projects, but they didn't necessarily, necessarily feel like their knowledge was actually empowered um, and they let them forward. Um, and that kind of lack of feedback loop um, was prevented volunteers from really having a, a good say over how they feel they should be involved and wasn't necessarily there. And of course, this is in some of the citizen science projects that I looked into, certainly the, the government funded ones. So, um, and other volunteers talked about how they felt very involved in their projects and they, they did have a good uh, feedback loop and they were able to shape things. Um, which is in some of the projects I looked into, particularly those funded by government, and those that became more professional in their organisation and development didn't necessarily have that. Um, so I think just to, to conclude the presentation, um, which I hope has been useful, and might provide more of a, a practical lens to some of the, the discussion in terms of a, uh, an active means of actually getting volunteers involved. Um, the key kind of thing that I find, which I hope can be a learning lesson, is that when these kind of things become more professionalised, when there's more involvement of the government through financial means at least, um, they can actually limit the, the active and open um, ability of participation. Um, and I think, certainly from my perspective, and learning from your interest in what I hope to contribute to, is that citizen science and knowledge school production in general shouldn't necessarily just be focused on doing management better and contributing to things, um, but it should really be about revising assumptions and putting forward alternatives as well. Um, certainly when we look into the environmental and social aspects, we see these projects looked into which have long-term been injustice um, or based in injustice. Um, certainly it should be that lens that it can be more challenging in the approach. And certainly in terms of what we'll talk about today, we do endorse more of a transformative approach to uh, sustainability in general. Certainly community participation can't just be about um, using data or using citizens as, as data drones or sensors. It should be more, there's a capacity as well as that to, to act in more of a, an activist way. Um, and certainly what Amanda talked about, Carlo, I said for wherever, it's not the best pronunciation, but I've always liked what he talked about as well and thought it was a good link as well as so the Foucaultian things to citizen science about knowledge is really just emerging solely because of invention and reinvention and, and the capacity of communities and individuals to get involved with that process is so important um, and crucial for the kind of future um, which we will see over the coming decades in terms of how climate change is affecting us. So I hope the presentation was interesting. Yeah, any questions, we're happy to answer. Thank you.